Hello, good day. This is the lecture recorded for the topic microbial regulatory systems. No? So for at the end of the lecture, uh, I hope that you will be able to describe the cell efficiently, uh, how the cell would efficiently control its metabolism. This is by regulating both enzyme synthesis and enzyme activity. So there are this, uh, this slide will uh, tell you about uh, the various types of enzymes, um, the constitutive and then the inducible enzymes. So, so these, are, these are the types of enzymes that you will be encountering when you study microbial regulatory systems. So when you say constitutive, these are the enzymes that are produced all the time. So no triggers, um, walang, kumagawa lang kailangan inducers, walang kailangan situation to push for the production of such enzymes. No? While the inducible enzymes, these are expressed only under conditions of adaptive value. So kumbaga, kung kinakailangan lang. No? So ganun, ganun siguro ka efficient no? and ka practical ang uh, microorganisms. So kumbaga, uh, why spend on something that you do not need? No? So they will try to uh, preserve the energy, you know, the minimal energy that they have, so that they will uh, be using it efficiently. So there are two uh, major approaches you not know, to uh, regulate uh, protein uh, function. You know? So ito yung tinatawag natin na gene expression. Kailan uh, may express a certain gene, you no? Know, Pagtungong protein. No? So, kumbaga, meron ka ng mga genes na to, but not all the time, you will be expressing that gene. No? Kunwari, meron kang genes, <laughs> pagiging matangkad, pero hindi siya na-express, hindi ka matangkad. No? So, for microorganisms, ganun din, there are various uh, genes that are present in the genome of a microbe, but not all the time, and not all of them, will be expressed. So the amount of protein synthesized can be regulated either at the level of transcription. This is by varying the amount of the mRNA made, meaning you can control the amount okay, of that enzyme or other proteins. Also, you can regulate at the level of translation. This means uh, by translating or not, or translating your uh, mRNA. So at this level of translation, you can control the activity. No? So uh, please check the difference. Huh? So at the level of transcription, uh, you control the amount of enzyme. And at the level of translation, you control the activity of a preformed enzyme or other proteins. So, uh, as I have mentioned, that uh, there are two types. No? Uh, the first, let's start with the first one. This will involve the DNA binding proteins and transcriptional regulation. Okay, example will be the DNA binding proteins. No, so when you say DNA binding protein, they are regulatory proteins that bind to specific sites on the DNA. Uh, binding will result then to the regulation of the gene expression, okay? So take note that inverted repeats are frequently the locations at which regulatory proteins bind specifically to DNA. Kaya minsan tinitignan yan sa sequences, no? So are there inverted repeats, okay? So DNA binding proteins are often homodimeric, meaning they are composed of two identical polypeptide subunits. All right, when you say DNA binding protein, um, an example of which would be your helix, turn helix structure, meaning helix, tas magta turn, and then helix a little, okay? So this consists of two segments of polypeptide chain that have an, uh, an alpha helix, uh, as, as their secondary structure. This is connected by a short sequence and this short sequence will form the turn, okay? So the first helix will serve as the recognition helix. 
So they will interact specifically with the DNA. The second helix will be the stabilizing helix. So this stabilizes the first helix by interacting with it. This is by way of hydrophobic interactions. So anong function ng turn? No? So the turn will link now the, the two helices. No? So the turn is consist of uh, around three amino acid residues. No? So the first usually is a glycine. Okay. So take note that sequences are recognized by non-covalent interactions. This will include hydrogen bonds and van der Waals contacts. So between the recognition helix of the protein and also specific chemical groups in the sequence of base pairs on the DNA. So example of this one will be your LAC and your tryptophan repressor proteins in E. coli. Do you still remember them? Okay. And then the proteins, of course, of your bacteriophage, the lambda repressor. So these are the examples. All right. So DNA binding protein, uh, there are also other structures uh, in addition to the helix, turn helix. This is your zinc finger and the leucine zipper. Okay. When you say zinc finger, it binds to zinc ions and it's found in regulatory proteins in eukaryotes. Okay, so the leucine zipper naman contains regularly spaced leucine residues that uh, functions to hold two recognition helices in the correct orientation to bind DNA. So kung titignan mo yung structure niya, para siyang zipper. Okay, kaya siya tinag na leucine zipper. All right. so there is a nice question. No, uh, you can, you can, um, ponder on this per, uh, particular bullets uh, after the lecture. No? Um, so proteins can bind to DNA when specific domains of the proteins bind to specific regions of the DNA molecule. And in most cases, the interactions are sequence specific. And proteins that bind to DNA are often regulatory proteins that affect the gene expression. Now, for your self-directed learning. You may try to explain how a protein ensures that it binds specifically to only a certain region of DNA and not to another, okay? So I wish you would like to read over about this particular self-directed learning box. The next type of DNA binding protein and transcription of regulation will be your negative control. Uh, negative control sometimes is called repression or an induction. Okay? So here's the scenario. For example, transcription is the first step in a biologic, biological information flow. Okay? So it is very simple. It is very efficient and it can serve to control gene expression at this point. So if one gene is transcribed more frequently than another, there will be more of its mRNA available for translation. And therefore, the, result, the resulting situation will be there will be a greater amount of its protein product in the cell. So take, uh, take note of that scenario. So negative control would mean preventing transcription, okay? So if you have so much of it, you can prevent transcription. So example of repression will be in this particular figure, okay? So repression will affect biosynthetic enzymes and enzymes are only made when, when only when the substrate is absent. No? So this is, a, this is a very nice example of your repression, okay? So this is another one. Uh, the, here in this scenario, the enzymes are only made only when the substrate is present. No? So, so the difference is that in this figure, it affects degradative enzymes, okay? So you, you, can, you can differentiate the two uh, figures. So for your self-directed learning again, here is a nice uh, point uh, for pondering. So the amount of a specific enzyme in the cell can be controlled 
by regulatory proteins that bind to DNA and increase, this means it will be induced, or decrease, meaning it will be repressed, no? uh, the amount of mRNA that encodes the enzyme, right? as I have mentioned previously. So in negative control of transcription, the regulatory protein is called a repressor, and it functions by inhibiting mRNA synthesis. Okay, so taking note of this scenario, here is my takeaway question. How is beta-galactosidase induced in cells? So imagine you at this particular scenario, and then how or when do you think a beta-galactosidase will be produced in cells? So after negative control, we have naman positive control. Now, an example of positive control will be your maltose operon. Na? In maltose operon, uh, or I mean in positive control of transcription, here the regulatory protein is an activator. Okay? So this means it can activate the binding of RNA polymerase to DNA. Example of positive regulation is the catabolism of the disaccharide sugar maltose. This, is, uh, this happens in E. coli, as you can see here in the picture. No? So the maltose activator here, uh, protein cannot bind to DNA. Okay? It cannot bind to DNA uh, unless it first binds to maltose as your inducer. Okay? So kung walang maltose, no uh, binding okay but when your maltose activator protein binds to your dn to your inducer here it can now bind to rna polymerase and uh, begin no uh, the transcription so he oh i'm sorry uh wait uh, okay wait a minute Okay, sorry, sorry for that. Okay, so in this particular figure, uh, I would like to show you uh, the binding of activator proteins. No, so here uh, during the binding, you can see the bending. No, uh, um, here. Okay, this is a bending like uh, configuration. Okay, of your DNA. So here, cyclic AMP receptor protein or CRP. No, uh, is your regulatory protein. And so this ensures the bending of your DNA so that binding no, to proceed transcription will happen. Another one is DNA looping. No? So nagloop siya. Can you compare this from A to B? This is for the protein and the nucleic acid to uh, make some contact. No? So the binding of activator proteins, uh, this is a, a very important uh, step no? uh, in regulation. So the role of the activator protein is to help the RNA polymerase recognize the promoter okay? because that is very important to begin the transcription. Okay, now... Let's go to another example of a positive control in the level of a regulon. No? So it's regulon is maraming operons all together. Okay? So in E. coli, the genes required for maltose utilization are spread out you know, over the chromosome in several operons, each of which you know, has an activator binding site to which a copy of the maltose activator protein can bind. No? So when uh, more than one operon is under the control of a single regulatory protein, this operon are collectively called a regulon. No? So take note that uh, when you wish to control the regulon, a specific DNA binding protein binds only at those operons it can control, regardless of whether it is, a, it is functioning as an activator or repressor. Okay? So in that case, other operons in the regulon will not be affected. All right? All right, so another thought bubble here. My question is how does an activator protein 
help RNA polymerase begin transcription. So for you to be able to answer that, you can take note of these self-directed bullets. Positive regulators of transcription are called activator proteins. They bind to activator binding sites on the DNA and stimulate transcription. Okay, So inducers modify the activity of the activating proteins and in positive control of enzyme induction, your inducer promotes the binding of the activator protein and thus stimulates transcription. All right. The next example will be global control. Okay. Uh, global control, ang best example nito will be the LAC operon. No? So the LAC operon. When you say global control system, so these are regulatory mechanisms that respond to environmental signals by regulating the transcription of many different genes. Okay? So example of this, maltose regulation and lactose operon. Okay? Ang, ang, ang pinaka laging pinag- uh, the discussion and the global control systems will be the dioxy curve. No? Uh, if you would remember, na mentioned ito sa Biology 120. No? Yung kapag binigyan mo ang E. coli ng dalawang carbohydrates, for instance, the first one will be glucose, and then the second will be, say, lactose, no? a disaccharide, it will first consume no? the monosaccharide or the simple sugar this is practically because it has the, the enzyme already available, no? constitutive. So when glucose is exhausted, saka pa lang siya magpuproduce ng inducible enzymes because lactose will induce the transcription of uh, the gene to produce, uh, uh, the gene to uh, utilize lactose. Okay? Ang tawag doon is a dye oxy curve, ibig sabihin nun, meron siyang dalawang exponential growth phase. No? So this is your dioxy curve. So, uh, so in global control systems, uh, yung ating cyclic AMP and the cyclic AMP receptor protein usually plays a major role. No? Catabolite repression relies on an activator protein and is actually a form of a positive control. Okay, so the activator protein here is called the cyclic AMP receptor protein, or sometimes you call it the CRP uh, molecule. So here you can see in this figure, this is the overall regulation of the LAC system, uh, and that the CRP will be the, the activator protein uh, of this uh, system. Okay, so global control systems, no, they regulate the expression of many genes, okay, and the catabolite repression is a global control system. So it is a siyang halimbawa ng global control system. It helps cells make the most efficient use of available carbon sources. So only when the initial carbon source, the easily utilizable carbon is exhausted, saka pa lang sila gagawa ng enzymes to uh, utilize the next carbon source. So the lac operon is under the control of catabolite repression as well as its own specific negative regulatory system. So now my question is, describe the mechanism by which cyclic AMP receptor protein or CRP, this is your regulatory protein ah, for catabolite repression function. Okay, so you can utilize the lactose operon as an example for you to understand this mechanism. All right, the next example will be transcription control, this time in archaea. Okay. So uh, recall you know, that in bacteria, two alternative approaches to regulating the activity of RNA polymerase is possible. Okay? You'll have your DNA binding proteins. So the DNA binding protein will block. Okay? Or you'll have your activator protein. These activator proteins will stimulate. You know? In eukaryotes, coordinate uh, numerous uh, DNA binding proteins. These are called the transcription factors. 
interacts with your RNA polymerase. In archaea, there are the so-called uh, repression of genes. No? For example, tingnan natin dito. So this is an example of nitrogen metabolism in the archaea methanococcus marie paludis. No? So uh, here we can see that uh, a certain no, a repressor protein can block no, uh, binding here. That means there, there's no, gonna, there's, uh, uh, th there will be no uh, transcription that will happen or that will proceed, okay? However, if your repressor protein can bind to alpha ketoglutarate, okay, it can, uh, it can uh, produce a complex as this one. And then after that, it will uh, lead to, uh, to the binding no, here. And then after that, transcription can proceed. Can you see the bending also? Kagaya nung nangyari sa CRP. No? So in, in uh, archaea, it is the NRPR as your uh, uh, repressor protein. Okay. All right, uh, and here uh, you can uh, check out also another archaea. You have your pyrococcus foriosus. So, tingnan nyo yung dual functionality of the protein TRMBL1. No? So, ito namang protein na to, uh, ang tawag sa kanila ay dual acting transcriptional regulator. Okay, so bakit dual functionality? Well, they can act as either repressor or pwede rin siyang activator. No? So example nito ay itong TRMB uh, and this is an example or uh, this is actually a family of uh, transcriptional regulators in archaea. Okay, so sabi natin archaea resemble bacteria in using a DNA binding activator and repressor proteins to regulate gene expression at the level of transcription. Can you describe no, as your thought bubble. The mechanisms used by RKL repressor proteins to repress transcription. Okay, so I hope you'll be able to answer that. All right, let's now go to the second example of regulation. Okay, so this is sensing and signal transduction. This is a, a two-component regulatory system. Okay, most signal transduction um, contains uh, two parts, okay? So, kaya tinatawag siya na two-component regulatory system. So, this consists of a specific sensor kinase protein. This is usually located in the cytoplasmic membrane. And then, uh, response regulator protein. And this one naman is present in the cytoplasm. So an example here in the figure is the gene expression via a two-component regulatory system uh, using your sensor kinase protein and your response regulator, regulator protein. So it depends on an environmental signal no, to be activated. So some here, here in this table also are some examples of uh, two component systems that regulate transcription in E. coli, like your ARC system, your nitrate and nitrite, or the respiration, or nitrogen utilization, the four regulon, and the porin regulation. So the osmolarity of the environment you know, controls the relative levels of the proteins, um, OMPC and OMPF. This is present or this can be found in the outer membrane of uh, Escherichia coli. No? So if the osmotic pressure is low, so uh, yung key don yung environmental signal. No? If the osmotic pressure is low, so the synthesis of your OMPF, a porin with a larger pore size no, will increase. Okay. But when the osmotic pressure is high, this other uh, OMPC, see, so the porin is smaller in pore size here, and they, they will be made in larger amounts. Okay, So ENVZ here 
This is a sensor, uh, histidine kinase, okay? And you can find it in the cytoplasmic membrane. So, so since it's a sensor, it can detect the changes in osmotic pressure, okay? So when a shift occurs, ENVC here no, is autophosphorylated as follows, and then it transfers its phosphate group to OMPR here. Once OMPR is phosphorylated, the response regulate, uh, the resp this is a response regulator of the system. So once this is phosphorylated, okay, what happens is that it can uh, bind here and then it can proceed transcription. Okay, so it, it depends on what the ENVC will sense, whether it's going to be transcribing OMPF to produce the big pore porine or OMPC, the smaller pore per view, okay? All right, so I would like you to describe the two components that give their name to the signal transduction system in prokaryotic cells, and what is the function on, of each of these uh, uh, components, no? So to give you an idea, I have here a self-directed uh, bullet bubble, no? So a signal transduction systems transmit environmental signals to the cell. So in bacteria and archaea, they have signal transduction typically carried out by a two component regulatory system. Okay, this includes a membrane integrated sensor, kinase, no? And of course, a cytoplasmic response regulator. And the activity of the response regulator depends on its state of phosphorylation. All right, let's now go to the second type of sensing and signal transduction. Perhaps you are very familiar with this one. This is your chemotaxis regulation, okay? So chemotaxis means responses to challenges such as nutrient limitation or toxin accumulation by moving toward attractant or moving away from repellent. Okay, so when you say regulation, it can control the transcription of genes encoding the flagellar proteins. No? So ito, ito ngayon yung tatakbo ba ako o lalapit? Tatakbo palayo o tatak, tatakbo palapit? No? So the degree of methylation of the methyl accepting chemotaxis proteins, this is your MCPs, control their ability to respond to attractants and repellents and leads to adaptation. So you can see here in this fi uh, figure, so you have uh, quite such a lot of attractants here. So this serves as now your signal. Uh, and then um, decrease of tractant binding uh, will trigger phosphorylation of uh, the complex, the CHEA and the CHEW complex. And uh, because of that, there will going to be signal transduction inside to, uh, to go ahead you know, and uh, uh, produce though, the necessary proteins for uh, flagellar motor. No? So flagellar motor, uh, this is a response to a signal. So adaptation allows the mechanism control uh, of flagellar rotation to be reset. Can you describe how this is achieved? So you can answer that using these bullets about chemotaxis regulation of chemotaxis and adaptation by methylation to allow the system to reset itself to the continued presence of a signal, okay? Okay, another favorite topic of mine will be quorum sensing. No? So um, quorum sensing uh, is a response to the presence in their surroundings of other cells of their own species, no? Quorum sensing cannot be achieved if you're alone. You can only do this no, uh, in groups. No? So in some species, regulatory pathways are controlled by the density of cells of their own kind. Take note, it depends on density. Kaya siya tinag na quorum. No? Uh, Gano ka nakadami? Di ba sa meeting ganun? Quorum na ba tayo? 50% plus one? Yan ganun, no? So this uh, density-dependent system you know, um, ensures that they will have sufficient numbers you know, before uh, they could uh, proceed with their uh, 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 regulation. You know? 
So here in this particular picture, uh, this is the uh, transcription of uh, the quorum specific proteins. So this is the expression of acyl homocerin lactone. And this uh, molecule serves as the signals or for communication between cell to cell so that they could go ahead you know, and uh, say build biofilms or colonize a certain uh, area. Uh, in the environment or where they are. So several applications of quorum sensing is bioluminescence and virulence. Uh, quorum sensing disruptors have been proposed as potential drugs no? uh, to disperse bacterial biofilms and prevent the expression of virulence uh, genes. No? So this is a very promising uh, a very promising technology that uh, if you're really very interested, you can come up with a particular proposal on this one. So quorum sensing allows cells to monitor their environment uh, for cells of their own kind. No? Uh, and then quorum sensing depends on the sharing of specific small molecules. These are called the autoinducers, like your uh, ACLs. And then once a sufficient concentration of the autoinducer is present, specific gene expressions will be triggered. Okay. So how can quorum sensing be considered a regulatory mechanism for conserving cell resources? So we we'll please try to explain that. The next one will be stringent response. No stringent response. Um, uh, then responds to amino acid starvation, but now a uh, widely distributed regulatory mechanism is used by bacteria to survive nutrient deprivation or environmental stress and antibiotic exposure. So when you trigger a uh, stringent response, ulti uh, ultimately it would lead to a shutdown of a macromolecule synthesis and the activation of stress survival pathways to improve the cell's ability to compete in nature. No? So, so normally, di ba, uh, kapag uh, merong uh, stressors, uh, ang ginagawa mo is you have to do something to adapt. No? So here are some of the examples uh, in the next side of the slide. So when you see here, uh, when there will be a nutrient downshift, your rRNA, your tRNA, and protein synthesis temporarily cease, okay? But sometime, sometime later, uh, growth can resume at a decreased rate, okay? So parang kumbaga, nag, uh, ano yung sa, sa phone, no? Uh, parang low energy rate ka or parang hindi ka masyano nagko-consume ng battery, kumbaga. But you still operate or you still function, no? Huh? So the, here's the structure of guanosine tetraphosphate. This is your trigger uh, needed for a stringent response in E. coli. So this is uh, what happens uh, during stringent response. Uh, normal translation, which requires charged tRNA. Uh, what, uh, and then here will be the synthesis of uh, uh, the PPGPP. So when cells are starved for amino acids, the uncharged uh, tRNA now can bind to the ribosome. This will stop now ribosome activity and uh, resulting to the uh, triggering no, the rel A protein to synthesize a mixture of PPPGPP and PPGPP. Now, so it's just a number of phosphorylations. Okay. Uh, here is an example of a uh, stringent response no? uh, that happens in, or this is a cool uh, applications in microbial ecology. No? So for example, when E. coli cells move from the nutrient rich intestines to the open water source, no? <laughs> so wastewater systems, no? yan, uh, ano yan? stringent response, yan. it calls for a stringent response. Kulang, no, ang nutrition. And then another one is when uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis cells enter a host, so they are exposed to the immune response. No? So they produce PPGPP, which converts some cells to relatively a dormant persister cells. No? 
So, yan yung uh, evasion mechanisms ng uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and it is controlled by a stringent response. No? Another one is for Caulobacter crescentus. This uh, bacteria naturally inhabits freshwater systems that are limited in nutrients. No? So, sabi nga nila, pag malinis yung tubig, malaming Caulobacter. No? So, if these cells encounter severe nutrient limitation, the stringent response is induced. Okay? So, Okay, uh, I was cut out. Apologies for that. So um, I was talking about this stringent response that are applications in microbial ecology for E. coli from intestines to open water source. MTB, no, uh, entering a host will lead to the production of persister cells. And of course, Caulobacter, due to uh, nutrient limitation, can change its morphology. You know, so they say that uh, the, uh, from stock cells, it can be converted into a swarmer cell. Magahanap siya ng, ng nutrients. No? And then kapag okay na ulit, then it will uh, uh, convert back to its stock cells. No? Okay, so stringent response is employed to survive nutrient limitation and stresses by decreasing expression of genes for macromolecule biosynthesis. No? So in addition to that, also to activate stress survival pathways. Now my question or for you, for your uh, self-directed learning, you can try to explain the sequence of molecular events that lead to the synthesis of PP, GPP or with another phosphorylation in E. coli, this is during stringent response. So some example of other global networks, this will be uh, tackled in your microbial physiology. Uh, and this will be very exciting for you to be able to, to check out some uh, applications. Okay, so... Uh, other global networks example, this is your full regulon. This, is, this happens in uh, streptomyces uh, uh, because of these particular species are filamentous. No? So if inorganic phosphate concentrations will be low, then this will be a signal no, uh, that will be sent to kinase 4R to phosphorylate FOP. Okay. Once phosphorylated, it can now recognize and bind promoter regions. So it will act as both an activator and a repressor. So this regulation results in increasing phosphorus metabolism by activating phosphate uptake genes and decreasing antibiotic production and nitrogen metabolism. This is through the repression of uh, genes regulating antibiotic production and glutamine synthetase. No? So meron siyang pin pinapaproceed, meron siyang uh, tinitigil. No? So here, here is uh, the, the overall uh, regulon. Okay, so another one, another global network will be your heat shock response. Okay, so the more denatured proteins there are, the lower the level of free DNA K and the higher level of RPOH. So the result here is heat shock gene expression. Kaya minsan ginagamit ang heat shock proteins to detect stress no? in some of uh, microbial community uh, transcription assays. Okay, so describe the proteins produced when cells of E. coli experience a heat shock what value are they to the cell? Another important applications of the heat shock will be uh, when you try 
to incorporate a gene no, during a transformation experiment. All right, so now let the third one, the third one will be the RNA-based regulation. So now the, this, this entails the, the role of the regulatory RNAs, or uh, this is the so-called the sRNA or the small RNAs. They exert their effects no, by base pairing directly to other RNA molecules, usually mRNA, which have regions of complementary sequence. So this binding immediately modulates the rate of target mRNA translation due to a ribosome that cannot translate double-stranded RNA. So sRNA provides an additional mechanism to regulate the synthesis of a protein once its corresponding mRNA has already been transcribed. Okay, so this is a figure to describe small uh, RNA mechanisms. This is to modulate translation of mRNA. No? So in, in this other side, this will be your translation inhibition to stimulate it. While the other one, this is your RNA degradation to protect. No? So it serves as protection. So uh, I hope you can be able to describe the mechanisms by which regulation of sRNA occurs. You can uh, take note of these bullets that cells can control genes in several ways by employing regulatory RNA molecules. And one way is to take advantage of base pairing and use sRNA to promote or prevent translation of mRNA. Next will be the ribo switch. This is another RNA-based regulation. So uh, some pathways uh, that uh, you can connect the uh, ribo switches with will be uh, vitamins, amino acids, uh, nitrogen bases of, uh, of uh, nucleic acids and uh, other things. So these are the pathways connected with your ribo switch. Catalytically active RNAs are called ribozymes. Okay, so uh, uh, other RNA molecules resemble repressors and activators in binding small metabolites and regulating gene expression. And tawag dito ay ribo switches. No? So, so they typically exert their control after the mRNA has already been synthesized. So most ribo switch control translation of the mRNA rather than its transcription, correct, no? So here's a cool fact. Some scientists believe that riboswitches are remnants of the RNA world, no? So a period eons ago before the cells, DNA and protein were present when it is hypothesized that catalytic RNAs were the only self-replicating life forms, no? So in such environment that has previously been described, they say that riboswitches may have been a primitive mechanism of metabolic control. So a simple means by which uh, RNA life forms could have controlled uh, the synthesis of other RNAs. So again, for your self-directed learning, uh, try to describe the mechanism by which a riboswitch regulates translation. All right, the next will be attenuation. Uh, an example of this one will be the attenuation of the tryptophan opron. When you say attenuation, this is a, a form of transcriptional control, okay? So uh, in bacteria, and they say that some archaea have also uh, this kind of regulatory system. So control is exerted after the initiation of transcription, but before the completion, no? So consequently, the number of completed transcripts from, uh, from an operon will be reduced even though the number of initiated transcripts is not. So the basic principle of attenuation is that the first part of the mRNA to be made, this is called the leader, can fold into alternative secondary structures. So tingnan nyo dito sa tryptophan operon. So in attenuation, uh, we call the leader peptide uh, as encoded by the regions one and two of your mRNA. No? So uh, ano yung scenario dito? When there is excess tryptophan, the ribosome translates the complete leader peptide. And so region two cannot 
pair with region 3. So regions 3 and 4 then will pair and they will form the loop and that will terminate transcription. No? So, kumbaga, nag-iba siya ng paperan. No? So, that's attenuation. So, attenuation is a mechanism whereby transcription is controlled after initiation of mRNA synthesis. Nagawa na yung mRNA. No? But, hindi po kasi kompleto. So, you can still try to regulate that. So, attenuation mechanisms depend upon alternative stem loop structures in the mRNA that regulate in either read through or stalling of the ribosome. Okay, so I hope you'll be able to describe in detail how a tryptophan attenuator is controlled. And then, of course, I think this is relatively easy for you. This is feedback inhibition. Feedback inhibition is the fourth example of uh, regulatory systems. Uh, this is by way of when you have uh, when you are over. Uh, uh, producing a certain product, you can control a certain enzyme. This is through feedback inhibition or the end product. Uh, I mean, the, the substrate cannot bind the, uh, to, the, to uh, the allosteric site. So it's allosteric inhibition or the inhibition of an ans uh, isoenzyme. No? So these are all examples of feedback inhibition. So I hope you'll be able to describe how feedback inhibition can be reversible. All right. So another example of uh, regulation of enzymes and other proteins is post-translational uh, regulation. So uh, an example will be in uh, P2 and glutamine synthetase. If you would uh, take a look at this uh, particular figure, this is in response to low cellular pools of glutamine. Okay, so what happens during regulation is that uh, they have to uh, regulate in order to produce glutamine. Okay. So... Uh, here, here, another one here will be the anti-sigma factor interaction. Uh, under normal conditions, your RPOE is sequestered at the membrane by RCA. So no transcription will be happening. Uh, however, uh, membrane stress will, will unfold OMP and it will trigger the degradation of your RSA, uh, RCA and freeing of RPOE. So because of this, uh, transcription can now proceed. So protein activity can also be regulated after translation and that reversible covalent modification or interactions with other proteins can also modulate protein activity. Okay, so the question, how can post-translational modification regulate the activity of an enzyme? So uh, the chapter reference for this presentation is chapter six of Brock, but of course you can uh, always uh, check out other microbiology books or even microbial genetics book that would be talking about uh, microbial regulatory systems. So if you have uh, any question, please let me know, send me some messages either in the Canvas inbox or social media messaging apps. Thank you very much. I think this will be my uh, last slide for the microbial regulatory systems recorded lecture.